From Gimlet, this is Startup. I'm Lisa Chow. About a year ago, a music streaming site called GrooveShark shut down. At the time, GrooveShark was nearly a decade old. It had tens of millions of users and was one of the largest music streaming services in the world. There were a bunch of headlines, a couple of think pieces, standard fare for the death of a tech company. But what the headlines didn't reveal was the novel that played out just beneath the surface as the company fell apart. We're going to hear that story today, but not from the people we normally hear from, the people at the top. Instead, we're going to hear from a small group of early employees, people who bought into the founder's vision and helped grow the company from an idea to a business. At its peak, GrooveShark employed more than 150 people, earned millions in revenue, and drew the ire of an entire industry. When you help build something like that, it changes you. GrooveShark was born in an unlikely place, far from Silicon Valley, in a small city in central Florida. Reporter Eric Mennel grew up in the same suburbs as the people who started GrooveShark. He has today's story. A quick warning, there is some swearing in this episode. Okay, here's Eric. Gainesville, Florida is a college town, home to the University of Florida Gators. It's right in the middle of the state, about halfway between Orlando and the Florida-Georgia border. The best restaurant in town is Satchel's Pizza, and the best table at Satchel's is actually inside a gutted 1965 Ford Falcon van. One of the best things to do at dusk on a Friday is to go out to the Bat House, which, as you might have inferred from its name, is a barn full of bats. Hundreds of thousands of them. And as the sun goes down, they swarm out into the night, to the delight of young couples and alumni in town for the next day's football game. This is where Jack DeYoung grew up. Jack's tall with curly black hair and the kind of tan you'd expect on a boy from Florida. At 21 years old, he was working part-time at a used bookstore in town. Not very much direction, and that's a really kind of polite way of putting it. Yeah, I was fairly listless and kind of looking for something, something big to attach myself to. One day, in 2007, Jack met up with a high school friend. The friend had gotten a job with a brand new startup in town, a company called GrooveShark. It was a music download site that wanted to end piracy, to get past the legacy of illegal file sharing sites like Napster. That sounded great to Jack, so it wasn't long before he got an internship at GrooveShark. He spent his first two weeks sneaking into the office early, so he'd look like the hardest worker on the team. Then, one night, at 4 a.m., he got an email from Josh Greenberg, the company's co-founder. Saying that he wanted to bring me on as, I think, a customer service representative. I suspect that he knew that I would be awake at that time, because we kind of all were. I replied to the email immediately and said, would you mind talking about this with me in person? And he said, sure, come on over. And I drove over to his house, which in Gainesville is that long commute of five minutes. Went in, we talked about it for about two hours. So from like 4 a.m. to 6 a.m., you discussed your your employment conditions? Pretty much, and I, I just blindly agreed to all of them. Jack was so excited, he called his mom. I'm rich, he told her. The job paid $24,000 a year. Shark was the brainchild of a freshman at the University of Florida, a guy named Sam Tarantino. Legend has it, Sam was driving by a used record store one day and thought, all I have are MP3s. Wouldn't it be great if I could sell my old ones online? He imagined splitting the revenue three ways. One part for the seller, one part for Sam's company, and one part for the musician. Sam was a business guy, a visionary, but he needed some help on the technology side. He found his better half in Josh Greenberg, another freshman. Josh was part of a tech entrepreneur club at the university, and he had cut his teeth making websites for people around town. In Sam Tarantino and Josh Greenberg, you had a marriage of opposites. Sam was short, high energy, he'd quote Winston Churchill when he got excited. Josh was tall, mild-mannered, analytical. Sam grew up well off, Josh came from a more modest home. And on March 31st, 2006, they and a third student named Andres Barreto started Escape Media. Their chief product was GrooveShark. They rented an office, a glorified closet really. They bought three computers and used the boxes those computers came in as desks. It wasn't much, but by the end of the year, they'd raised about a million dollars in seed money, moved into a bigger office, and then they started hiring people. That's when Jack DeYoung, the intern who'd sneak in early, showed up. The energy in that room and the way that everybody talked about what they were doing, it felt like something big was going to happen. Around the same time, Isaac Mordock joined the company. 
He was a stocky 19-year-old with shaggy brown hair and substantial glasses. He was going to the community college in town when he got an internship at Groove Shark. And within months, he'd landed a full-time job there, selling ads for the homepage. His qualifications, you ask? I guess I didn't have any uh, qualifications other than I was extremely passionate and willing to work all hours of the day, all hours of the night. How did you do it? We would follow the sun around the planet at some point. Like we were calling people in Australia and just phone call after phone call. You're just like, oh, this guy's probably just going to hang up on me again or be like, how the hell did you get my number? And So if you were to make 500 phone calls in a week back then, how many of them would result in ad sales? I mean, early, like zero. (laughs) 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 I mean, it was rough. It was really rough. I was, I think, more inspired, honestly, that these guys who were so young were like so confident in themselves and their ability to do more than open, say, like a taco shop. And this is John Ashenden. At 21, he was one of Groove Shark's oldest employees. His blonde hair was both slick and earnest, and he was the kind of guy whose brow always seemed to be furrowed. He started at the company on the design team. If we're going to change the world, be the next like Facebook, we're going to be the next YouTube. That was the energy, right? And I know like today that's so cliche and like I'm sure everybody has that same aspiration, but at the time it felt so achievable and like it didn't in any way seem unrealistic to me. These three employees, Jack, the eager intern, Isaac, the sort of salesman, and John, the designer, were among the first at a company that would grow to over 150. They were some of the earliest to buy into Sam and Josh's vision, and they made a fateful decision to dedicate the better part of their youth to a hunch that something big was about to happen in music, and Groove Shark would be at the center of it. But Groove Shark was still missing one thing. Users. The company had a little bit of seed money left, they had dedicated employees, but people weren't using their product. And as Jack DeYoung remembers it, they were under pressure from their investors. Get 50,000 users by a certain date, or risk losing support. I, I can distinctly remember begging our mothers to sign up for the website <laughs> at one point. Um, and, you know, posting on Facebook and just saying, like, please, for the love of God, sign up for this. So they started marketing around town, and it got a little desperate. There was a really, really ill-advised marketing thing to have fake parking tickets uh, on cars <laughs> in downtown Gainesville that actually advertised for Groove Shark. One, not only are we going to piss off everybody, but there was a misprint on the fake parking ticket. It's supposed to say <laughs> 7.2 million songs, and it said 7.2 songs. So we're right. offering 7.2 songs, and this is what everybody in downtown Gainesville saw. It, it was a, a comedy of errors for a very long time. The team struggled like this for a year and a half, trying to get users for a product that people didn't seem to want, trying to get advertisers for a site no one seemed to visit. They were generating almost no revenue and had mostly burned through that initial seed money. And then, one afternoon, the two founders, Sam and Josh, called everybody into the conference room. The news wasn't good. Designer John Ashenden was in the room when Sam started talking. You know, he let everybody know, like, hey, we're like cash dry in two weeks, and I can't pay anybody in here. If you guys want to leave, I completely understand. And he didn't even really offer any compensation alternative. There was no like, I'm going to give you guys more stock for those of you who stay or anything like that. It was just generally like him appealing from his heart to everybody. Like, I've hit the end right now. I'm doing everything I can. And I'm hoping you'll stick with me. Every single person did, except for like one guy. It was a testament to two things. The first, the rent in Gainesville, Florida is really cheap. While $1,000 might get you a tiny bedroom in San Francisco, it'll get you a townhouse in Gainesville. The second and more important thing that moment signaled was buy-in. The people in that room believed they were on a mission to make the music industry better for fans and artists. The whole endeavor spoke to them. And I think you know, that for me was like truly the like moment where I was like all in. I was like, this, this company's great. Everybody here is like bought into the same vision. We're all fighting the same fight. But the fact remained, if the public didn't want the service, Groove Shark wasn't going to survive. 
They needed to try something new. And the idea for that new thing was, as often happens, right in front of their faces. A small feature already built into the product. On peer-to-peer sites like GrooveShark, all the content came from users' libraries. So you could type in the name of a song you wanted to download, say, Virtual Insanity by Jamiroquai, and you could see every version of that song that had been uploaded by users. There might be 30 different versions, but within that, some files would be good quality, others really crummy, or even mislabeled, and you'd wind up downloading an entirely different song than what you thought you were paying for. To avoid having users buy stuff they'd later resent, GrooveShark had a preview feature. You could click a button next to the file you wanted to download and play through it first. Designer, John Ashenden. And what we found was that the users were just streaming it and then they weren't downloading it. That was the behavior. I mean, it sounds so, so simple when you say it like that. It does seem simple now. But back in 2007, almost nobody was doing this with music. So put yourself back at your computer desk nine years ago. If you were listening to music, you were likely either toting around CD wallets or you were downloading MP3s. You would download a song to your computer, plug in your iPod, and sit there, an Apple product purgatory, watching your library sync up. 1%. 2%. 3%. It was a hassle, but it was our hassle. We simply didn't know there could be something better. So the engineers at GrooveShark, they got together and they started scheming. They wanted to design the simplest version of GrooveShark imaginable. Out with the downloads and 99 cent transactions, all they wanted was the cleanest version of that preview button. And what one engineer cooked up was a design more simple and elegant than even most of what you see on the internet today. At the middle of the page was a search bar. And that was it. You type in your song and it would start playing. And within like basically a couple weeks, we had like a functioning prototype of what our product would look like if it was just streaming. And then it kind of got up to Sam and, you know, here, here's Sam who's like kind of struggling to make payroll. And he saw this thing and was like, this is it. This is like our thing. This is the thing that we're going to just dump everything into and launch it and pray for a miracle. They launched the new site in 2008. John Ashenden, their chief designer, sat back and waited for the response. And it was insane, like literally insane. I think within a matter of a month, we had gone from like 10,000 users to like 50,000 users. And then like another month, we were at like 100,000 users. It just was compounding. It was crazy. Instantly starting to grow 20 plus percent month over month. Isaac Mordock, the sales associate. It wasn't like Uncle Bob signing up or, or whatever. It was, we have no idea who these people are, and they're logging in, and they're using it every day. It was sort of unbelievable. And that's Jack DeYoung, the intern turned customer service rep. There were write-ups in Mashable, The Atlantic. I remember one of the developers had rigged up something that would have balloons pop every time we hit a milestone. Like actual balloons or like be on no, your not computer actual, screens? No, not actual balloons. It could be like a, a projector. Yeah, we, we, don't, we didn't have the money for that kind of helium. <laughs> you know, it, it was so, like, exciting in the beginning, right? Like, every day we'd hit a new record, and then it was, like, every twice a day we'd hit a record, and then, you know, every hour. And then it literally got to a point where, like, we were hitting a new record, like, every five or ten minutes. The balloons just sort of wouldn't stop popping. And it, we had to turn it off. Like, it was <laughs> so annoying. <laughs> you know, would it become, let's get to 50,000 users or lose our jobs became... Oh my, oh my, the genies have the bottle. It was like no doubt in anyone's mind in the company that like this is what people want to do. They do not want to deal with MP3 files. They do not want to deal with hunt and peck for like individual songs and hoping the quality is good. And, and also, as controversial as it may be, they don't want to pay for individual songs either. They want something that's cheap, easy, even free. And they want it immediately. Coming up, what's wrong with cheap, easy, and free? And what it would look like if Martin Scorsese directed your next management offsite? After these words from our sponsors. (laughs) 
This episode of Startup is brought to you by Squarespace. Squarespace makes it easy to build a beautiful website, portfolio, or online store. But building a website, it wasn't always this easy or this fast. Remember this sound? Brings you back, doesn't it? Dial-up internet service. The reason why it sounded so weird is that you were connecting through the phone line. And the thing about a phone line is that they're built for the human voice. They're not built to handle digital information. So when you connected to the internet, all that digital information had to translate itself into frequencies that an analog system like a phone line could understand. So think of this sound as digital information trying to speak. It's poetic, really. The internet has come a long way, and these days, building a website is easier than ever thanks to Squarespace. Start your free trial today at squarespace.com. When you decide to sign up for Squarespace, make sure to use the offer code STARTUP to get 10% off your first purchase. Squarespace. Build it beautiful. Welcome back to Startup. I'm Lisa Chow. When we left, the employees of GrooveShark had just designed a new version of their website. They were becoming a streaming service, something virtually nobody else was doing at the time. And it was working. Eric Menel picks up the story. Part of the original mission at GrooveShark had been to make things better for artists. Since GrooveShark couldn't make money on downloads anymore, the new plan was to make money chiefly through ads on the site and subscriptions for ad-free streaming. From that revenue, they could theoretically give the artists a cut. Now, all this new user growth, since they switched to streaming, it meant GrooveShark could get real meetings with big brands. Brands like Pepsi, Bacardi, Samsung. In the first full year after streaming, revenue at the company had grown from roughly $10,000 to $100,000. And before long, GrooveShark was earning over a million dollars a month. They were becoming a player in the industry, sponsoring festivals. They turned a tour bus into a studio for exclusive live performances from big-name bands. Everybody, we're fits and attachments, and you're watching Groove Shark Sessions. Jack DeYoung, the once eager intern, was now running the music department. One year at South by Southwest, he and John Ashenden, the designer, they got hooked up with tickets to a secret Kanye West show. They even managed to get backstage. I think Jack was playing a game of basketball, like pickup with most deaf. <laughs> and... <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, it was, a, it was a bunch of people back there. I think Rick Ross is back there, as he's Ansari. They actually decided to sneak even further backstage at that show. Jack remembers watching John stumble through the curtains, getting dangerously close to the actual stage where Kanye was performing. The music is so loud that I'm screaming to the top of my lungs, like, John, John, you have to stop. Like, you have to stop. And John just keeps going. I'm sure he was like, you know, don't, like slow motion, you know? Like, <laughs> and John literally trips. Like trip over this this guy who's like bent over, like tying his shoe. I turn around to Jack and he's just got his like hands, like he's got this like expression on his face, like uh, Macaulay Culkin, you know, in like Home Alone. <laughs> like hands to the cheeks, just mouth agape. Just like <laughs> cannot believe what's happening right now. And I'm like, what is going on? Kind of took me a, 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 what felt like an attorney, but it was probably like two seconds. And I looked down, I realized it was Kanye West. And Kanye looks at John and goes, y'all need to get the fuck out of here. Yo, get the fuck out of my way. Get the fuck out of here. <laughs> and uh, we can just see that there's like some backstage security guard like beelining it towards us. And John literally jumps over a crouching Kanye and we run as fast as we can out of the building. Oh my gosh. Yeah. That's how you know you've arrived. Kanye yells at you. I know. I called my, my now wife like four in the morning, Austin time too. I'm like, Connie just yelled at us. It's the greatest thing that's ever happened. She's like, I'm going to bed. Shut up. Amidst the glamour the team had literally stumbled into, one question perpetually hung over their heads. A 2007 headline in Venture Beat summed it up pretty succinctly. GrooveShark offers P2P music downloads, but is it legal? I mean, that was always kind of like a constant question and constant debate. You know, where where do we sit in the legal spectrum from purely illegal all the way over to every I is dotted, every T is crossed, you know, money constantly flowing back to rights holders? Like, what? where are we in the spectrum? GrooveShark had been operating in a murky area. They said they wanted to pay artists, but largely those deals weren't in place yet. So they were streaming songs they didn't own and didn't have licenses to. They did have some cover, though, a law called the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, or DMCA. 
It says websites can't be held liable for songs that users upload. The website just has to take the song down if the artist asks them to. But GrooveShark was not always very good at handling all those takedown requests. Some musicians said they had trouble getting their music off the site. And of course, even if a song got taken down, some new user could just re-upload the song the next day. GrooveShark claimed it was acting in good faith, but artists and labels had their doubts. So one of the four major labels, EMI, then responsible for about a quarter of the popular music out in the world, sued them for $15 million. I think, honestly, though, it was kind of scary. It was also uh, a bit exciting, too, right? Because it's like we are worth even caring enough to sue. It wasn't like this is the end. This was like a, we're all just going to tighten up together as a team and, and we're going to make it work. Here's Isaac Mordock again, the sales associate from before. By this time, he'd actually figured out the sales thing and worked his way up to chief revenue officer. We've gone through harder times. Remember when we weren't getting paid for four months and we're about to go out of business? Now we have money and you know we're able to like stand and fight against it. But the EMI lawsuit was just the beginning. It was around this time that Jack DeYoung had another backstage experience, one very different from the Kanye affair just months before. It was 2011, and he was behind the scenes at Lollapalooza, the big music festival in Chicago. It's uh, probably probably about 4 p.m. Um, you know, we're sitting backstage, and I'd run into uh, an executive at an unnamed major record label, and he kind of just took me aside. It's like, it's coming this certain person is declared legal jihad and you just be forewarned. Seven months later, the hammer dropped. Universal Music Group, the largest record label in the world, sued. They were roughly 9,000 times the size of GrooveShark and wanted $17 billion in damages. And Universal wasn't just going after the company. They targeted seven individual employees as well. You know, like it was was something to the tune of of like one and a half billion dollars just for me. Um, that wow. that's if the court were to award, you know, the maximum per song damage. I mean, that didn't even seem real. Yeah. This data doesn't even seem real. It was so much money. It was like not even like a real number. <laughs> okay. You know, like, yeah, you can take the money, but like, you're going to get my couch and maybe my car and that's about it. It wasn't just the size of the suit that was daunting. It was the evidence Universal had on its side. The suit alleged that GrooveShark didn't just flout takedown requests, but that from the very start, Its employees were uploading songs to the site themselves. Remember that law, the DMCA? It said GrooveShark was not liable if its users uploaded copyrighted songs, so long as the company wasn't uploading them itself. But GrooveShark's employees were also its users. And that really complicated things. You had instances where employees within the company, uh, you know, not naming anyone in particular, they themselves had, you know, their own collection connected to the network as well. I mean, you had people not just doing this out of their apartment. Like some people had their computer just running at work, right? And I mean, that that starts to become really questionable. Myself today, I look back, I'm like, yeah, of course, like no way that we, that should have ever happened. Like that's completely unacceptable. You kind of sat in this really tricky spot where you were were kind of putting a mark on our head. Perhaps the most damning evidence Universal threw at GrooveShark were the management's own words. Universal had internal emails from Josh Greenberg and board chairman Sina Simintobe, emails that suggested illegal behavior. Sina wrote one email to an advisor about GrooveShark's growth. He said, The only thing that I want to add is this. We are achieving all this growth without paying a dime to any of the labels. Let's keep this quiet for as long as we can. The email actually reads, Let's keep this quiet, Q-U-I-T-E, Uh, But everyone was pretty sure it was just a typo, and he meant to say, keep it quiet. This email was plastered across the internet, and when Cena's employees read it, they had concerns. He kind of sounded like really shady. John Ashenden again. I don't think he was trying to be like a a bad guy or anything, but it's just kind of how he would say things every now and then. And like, imagine, I mean, if you're Universal's lawyers and you read that, that's going to throw up like a red flag. I reached out to Cena for this story. He declined to be interviewed, citing legal restrictions that prevent him from talking about GrooveShark. Business started going sour. Advertisers dropped out. A deal with a major car company evaporated. This is Jennifer Hutton, VP of Advertising. Someone would lose a a campaign and say, 
you know, they told me it was because of legal stuff. The feedback they were getting was that these brands didn't want to work with us because of our legal problems. And this is where things at GrooveShark took an ugly turn. All these legal issues, they started to trickle down, first into the business and then into the very relationships that made GrooveShark so strong to begin with. That unity that was so present at the beginning of the company started to splinter. What needed to happen to stop all the lawsuits was for GrooveShark to sign deals with the major labels. But managers at GrooveShark disagreed about how to get this done. Essentially, there were two camps. One camp thought they needed to play by the music industry's rules, to hire insiders, old-school producers and executives who'd worked at the major labels, who could help negotiate on GrooveShark's behalf. The advisors with clout is what we always needed. Chris Blackburn was director of brand partnerships at GrooveShark. He says the people at GrooveShark, while ambitious, didn't have any status in music industry boardrooms. Its executives would walk into meetings in t-shirts, sandals, and jeans. One guy had a ponytail. They didn't know the lingo. They didn't have the connections. And that became a real problem. You're playing in a game that you are a nobody in, and you're viewed as less than a nobody. You're viewed as uh, an enemy. So in terms of getting, in, getting anything meaningful done, it was really about bringing in people who could provide GrooveShark access to the bright future we all wanted to have. But the company's top leadership, they seemed to reject this strategy. In those emails that Universal cited, GrooveShark chairman Sina Simintope outlined what appeared to be his strategy for growing the company. In one email he writes, We bet the company on the fact that it is easier to ask for forgiveness than it is to ask for permission. In another email he writes, In our case, we use the label songs until we get 100 million uniques, that's unique users, by which time we can tell the labels who is listening to their music where, and then turn around and charge them for the very data we got from them. Sina was one of Groove Shark's earliest investors. He'd had success in real estate out west and was a mentor to Sam Tarantino, the company's founder. Sam put a lot of trust in him, but Cena doesn't appear to have had much, if any, experience in the music industry prior to working with GrooveShark. And so the camp that wanted to make nice with the labels, they found themselves in a really frustrating position. They saw what they viewed as a problem, but they couldn't do anything about it. The only people who could do anything were their bosses, Sam, Cena, and Josh. I reached out to Sam for this story, but he also declined, citing legal restrictions that prevent him from talking about the company. Some of the company hoped they'd find an ally in Josh Greenberg, GrooveShark's other co-founder. But for Josh's part, he was a tech guy, a product guy. Largely, it seems, he left the business decisions up to Sam. Josh trusted Sam. Sam trusted Cena. For Isaac Mordock, chief revenue officer, the whole thing became so frustrating, he lashed out at Josh Greenberg directly. He ran into Josh at a party one night and brought up the issue. At one point at this party, I was I I saw him and we kind of had like some small chit chat and and uh, I slapped him. I was like, Josh, what? like, what are you thinking? Wake up, man! Like, you hit him just because like I, I thought nothing was getting through to his head. And here's somebody that I greatly respect, one of the most logical people that I knew and had worked with, and was like a brother to me. If anybody can help impact where this company's gonna go right now, it's you, man. Like, why aren't you seeing this? Hmm. Uh, and, then we, and then we hugged it out and cried. There had been more and more kind of internal uh, uh, feuding. John Ashenden, former designer, now creative director. And in fact, many of us who were on that kind of leadership leg of the company had started having side conversations where we were like, you know, talking about how we weren't happy with the direction, how we weren't happy with Sam, Cena, what do we need to do to fix this? There was even like discussions of like almost like an overthrow, a coup, if you will, of like leadership. Wow. Um, and yeah, it, it had gotten pretty nasty. And I, and, and I know Sam and I know Josh, you know, they they were not blind to it at all and knew that this was going on, and they decided to call a emergency meeting. The meeting was going to be an offsite, scheduled for two days in Gainesville, February 13th and 14th of 2012. I've heard people call this meeting a number of things. D-Day, the Exodus. The most common, though, was the St. Valentine's Day Massacre. There were about 12 people in attendance. 
eight or nine top managers. And then at the head of the table was Cena, the chairman, flanked to his left and right by Sam and Josh. Day one was a long day. Hours, like probably 10, 11 hours in this room, everything being moderated by Cena, Mm -hmm. where we just kind of like bitched we complained it was it was Mm -hmm. it was it was really shitty honestly this meeting it was like us going around the room talking about how we felt and what we felt we were doing wrong and what we needed to do differently and where sam had fallen short and um where we needed new leadership or a change our direction everybody you know it was kind of becoming very obvious where everybody stood and who who was like aligned with our direction who was very clearly not aligned with our direction This went on for many, many hours, just going around the table and complaining, like trying to do group therapy without a licensed therapist in the room. And the whole time, Sam Tarantino, he wasn't saying anything. He was just sitting there, listening. At the end, he finally spoke up. The first thing that he said was that we were all ungrateful. Like, you know, he's like, instead of saying like, you know, you guys are passionate about this and appreciate, you know, the feedback and everybody's, you know, hard work. He he just like, I can't believe that you're questioning our strategy. And I just, you guys are just all so ungrateful. I think for most people in that room, they really took his response, myself included, in a really bad way and saw it as like, he's missing the message here and seeing this as nothing more than a personal attack on him. And that missing the message that these are all people who deeply, deeply care about the success of this company as much as he does and are angry. Everyone went home, slept it off. The next day, they reconvened. Most people figured they had aired all their grievances, and now it was time to think about next steps. How do we fix these problems? They ordered pizza. Here's Jack DeYoung. We ordered Papa John's, I remember, because there were paper plates, and I remember writing out little notes to uh, Paul, who was to my right, and sliding them over to him, and actually kept that uh, paper plate for quite a while after that. What were some of the notes that you wrote down? One was, someone needs to know the definition of the word literally, (laughs) was one of them. Um, Another was, I feel like Hester Prynne. Hmm. And the very last one was, I'm pretty sure I'm about to resign. Cena starts the meeting off, again, acting as moderator. He starts by essentially saying, like, we've heard everybody, um, and we know where you stand, and we're going to make some decisions here in this room. But it's important that when everybody leaves this meeting, that everybody is in line with those decisions, and we no longer have a moment like this where, you know, there is backdoor discussions and people planning coups and like you know kind of kind of outlining the the energy again right and at one point he he, he drew um, a triangle on the wall and was like i just want everybody to know that i control every point of the the company's uh position so i am the i control um all of the preferred shareholders they all vote with me i'm chairman of the board uh, you know, Sam and, and Josh are the only other people on the board. They always vote with me. I'm one of the largest common shareholders. I just want everybody to know that, you know, ultimately I'm where the buck stops in the company. And you're, we're like, oh man, like, you know, he just went out and said it. And he's like, now Sam runs the company and, you know, he's the, he's the visionary and all, but, you know, I'm the one that writes the law. But it, it almost felt like the way it was delivered whether he intended it or not, came off as very authoritarian and almost like a dictator. Hmm. And it did not sit well with me at all. And it did not sit well with a lot of people either. Instead, he basically created like an ultimatum scenario where everyone was required basically to uh, uh, pick a side almost. Like, are you with us or are you out? And um, There's a line in the sand. Yeah, and I think... I was not prepared for that. I was not prepared for that. The people in that room, among them Jack, Isaac, and John, they had all started at this company basically as kids, when the idea of a management offsite was as foreign to them as a polar bear in a palm tree. Now, they were executives, with other people's lives depending on their actions. At the same time, 
there wasn't that much distance between the fake parking tickets and the billions of dollars in lawsuits hanging over their heads. They were still in their 20s, still living with their best friends, and they were figuring out, on the fly, how to respond to an ultimatum that could change the course of their lives. So they go around the room, person by person. First is the VP of Community Development, a guy named Graham Murphy. And Graham, upon hearing this, he stood up and fist bumped me and said to the room, sorry guys, I gotta go see about a girl, which is a line from Goodwill Hunting. <laughs> uh, and that's how he quit. That's how he quit, and they walked out, didn't say a word, and texted me 10 minutes later and said, I realize that I'm your ride home, give me a call. Next, John Ashenden. He had started at the company as a designer and was now a senior VP and head of product design. He quit too. It felt like you were giving up. When you were six years in, like, you know, kind of admitting that, like, this just is not going to work for either of us and we need to go. A couple people later, the guy who couldn't make a sale years before but was now chief revenue officer, Isaac Mordock. Well, I think we were all even, like, fighting back tears because we'd all given our lives to this project. It was something that, you know, it wasn't just a job. It was it was family. It was um, a, a very deep commitment we had all made for years of our life. Isaac quit. Then, the very last person. And that's when I think I wrote to Paul, I think I'm going to resign. A once eager intern, now senior VP of the music department, Jack DeYoung. It, it almost felt like, okay, there's an out and... It just seemed if there ever, ever there's going to be a right time, it's going to be right now. Half the leadership in the room quit that day. It was a far cry from five years before, when those same people had gathered in a conference room to hear Sam tell them they weren't getting paid for a while. Then they decided to stay. Now they were leaving. The only constant? It was never about the money. The meeting ended. People were kind of floating around the parking lot. Nobody really knew what to do. Eventually, John Ashenden saw the door to the building open. It was Josh Greenberg, the co-founder. I'll never forget Josh Greenberg came out about 30 minutes or so later, and um, he gave me like a really big hug and, uh, you know, told me that it was really hard for him too and um, that he was like super happy to have worked with me and proud of me and... Uh, I don't know. It was just so genuine, you know, like despite the fact that I had essentially turned my back on him and his company, that he was happy for me. Yeah. And and, and excited for what I was going to do next. It feels like this little spark of like humanity in this moment and period that was just like cluttered with politics and bullshit. Definitely. Yeah. And I mean, that's and that that's who Josh was. He just had this like charismatic, positive spirit that um, made you feel like that everything was going to be fine. That was a really difficult time. Jennifer Hutton, head of accounts. Well, a lot of people quit that day. Plenty, like Jennifer, stayed and tried to make sense of it. It felt like the end of the company. It felt like, okay, if all these people are leaving, how can we possibly survive? What does this mean? What really happened? It was... Definitely a place of fear. Within the span of a couple of months after that, almost my entire team had left. People I was working with every day, people I considered my friends, people who I shared my frustrations with, my joys with, if they didn't leave on that day, they left within two months. Mm -hmm. And I was kind of left alone. At the same time, a Swedish music startup that had been making waves in Europe launched its U.S. operations. With $200 million in venture capital and deals with all the major record labels, Spotify was here. When Spotify launched in the U.S., we started to see our users drop. Hmm. And revenue dropped too. And it kind of took away any sense of the little bubble that we had around us and this mentality of, okay, we're going to succeed because we're doing this really different thing and, and we're the only ones doing it. And were so popular, and it kind of brought us back to reality a little bit. Spotify had taken the opposite approach of GrooveShark, and largely, it worked. They'd raised money early, used a lot of it to pay for licensing deals with the labels, and then launched, free of the legal maelstrom that overtook Gainesville. It's not crazy to look at Spotify and think, huh, that could have been GrooveShark.
It was three more years after the St. Valentine's Day Massacre before Groove Shark folded. And I don't want it to seem like those last three years were simply a black hole of difficulty and despair. Of course, their numbers were down and they were losing money. Sony and Warner joined the Universal suit, so quite literally, the entire music industry was now gunning for them. A lot was going wrong. But there were other things happening too. The people who stayed, they became even closer. There was a Dungeons and Dragons game night a bunch of engineers had organized. Then there were two game nights, then three. Much of the company still lived in the same apartment complexes and went out drinking together at the same bars every weekend. The Christmas parties were unlike anything else in town. I talked to a lot of employees from the company and the best way I can think of to describe those last couple years is like when you go away to camp for a week and on Thursday night, there's a dance and people are doing the limbo and they're eating too many cookies and you're thinking to yourself, maybe we could all just stay out here, out in the woods, form a little colony. Maybe we'll never have to go back to real life. And then, the lights dim, and it's the final song. When we first heard it, there was a that moment where we just had to like blink a couple times and be like, did, did, did that just happen? Nick Antonelli was an engineer at Groove Shark. He was there on April 30th, 2015, when Sam called for an all-staff meeting. He said the company would be closing down that afternoon, and that Groove Shark's homepage would show a letter, admitting guilt of copyright infringement. It was unreal in a way. We had, they had officially addressed it earlier that day, and we knew the letter was supposed to come out at a certain time. And there were a few developers working on taking down the site and putting the letter up, and so they were working at their desks, and the rest of the office had kind of gradually stopped what they were doing and moved to join them. It was five or six, maybe, developers sitting at a little island of desks, and the entire company was standing next to them in a big circle. And we started playing music from Groove Shark. We basically had a playlist going on Groove Shark, and we just started dancing to it. You know, everybody was laughing, and then half of us were crying. And then we were laughing again, and we were just kind of having a good time playing music together. I think we ended with Sister Hazel, uh, which I'm, I'm not sure if you know, they're, they're a band that came out of Gainesville. They're a Gainesville band. Yeah, I knew that. Yeah. Yeah. All for you, the song. Hard to say what it is I see in Yeah, I think I think that was the one. I actually have a video of us prior to us flipping the switch on the server. <laughs> and then we're all gathered around one of my teammates' desks and he pressed the button and we shut off everything. And then we all stopped and read the letter together. Mm-hmm. And what was that like? God, that letter was such crap. <laughs> that letter was rough to read. Dear music fans, the letter read, Today we are shutting down Groove Shark. We started out nearly 10 years ago with the goal of helping fans share and discover music. But despite best of intentions, we made very serious mistakes. We failed to secure licenses from rights holders for the vast amount of music on the service. That was wrong. We apologize, without reservation. The letter then says that Groove Shark is forfeiting all of its intellectual property to the record companies and urges people to sign up and pay for legal streaming services. The first one they mention is Spotify. And that was it. Overnight, the company was gone. People packed up their boxes, they threw out old files, and they wiped the servers clean. Then, three months later, news broke. 28-year-old Josh Greenberg, the co-founder of Groove Shark, passed away last night. Gainesville okay, so police say Greenberg was found by his girlfriend around 9 p.m. Friends and colleagues tonight are mourning a person they say was an innovator, a mentor, and an even bigger advocate for our community. Josh dying so close to Groove Shark closing made so many people think that he had taken his own life or that, you know, Grushart closing and him dying were related. This is Abby Mayer, Josh's girlfriend. She'd been out of town that weekend. She'd last talked to him late Saturday night. And when she got back to the house that she and Josh shared on Sunday, she found him lying in bed next to his laptop. 
At first she was talking to him. She thought he might have been sleeping. But she's a nurse, and she says when she looked closer, she could tell. He was gone. He'd been dead for almost 16 hours, according to the medical examiner. There were no signs of foul play or suicide. When the coroner's report came back, it listed his cause of death as undetermined, something that happens in about 2 to 5% of cases across the country. So, not unheard of, but very rare. Gainesville police put that information out right away. But it didn't stop people from speculating that Josh had cracked under the pressure of losing his company. The people that said that, like, you you just knew that they didn't know him very well. Like, after it was over, though, that constant stress and that constant roller coaster and the constant, like, up and down of Grishark and the lawsuits and everything, once that was over... You know, obviously losing Grushark was hugely upsetting, but also that stress was gone, and that was such a huge burden lifted off of him. It just felt like a lot of opportunity opened up. And, you know, when Josh died, it was it was the opposite. My world collapsed. One thing that... I've learned about this whole experience is that it's certainly not linear. It doesn't get easier every day and it doesn't become more normal. It, you know, it ebbs and flows. We're here to celebrate Josh's life. I'd like to welcome everybody here. Um, We're going to have a set of speakers. We're going to have some videos. We're going to have pictures. Nearly 600 people showed up to Josh's funeral. The University of Florida let the reassembled Groove Shark employees use one of the auditoriums on campus. The mayor spoke, the former president of the university, business leaders and students Josh had mentored. Employees from all eras of Groove Shark were there, from the founding up until the final song. At the end of the service, Sam got up to speak, and then he sat down at a piano, and he paid tribute to Josh the best way that he knew how, through music. In startup culture, a failed business can be a sort of merit badge. It's something founders carry around with them to their next project, part of their origin story about how they had to fail before they could succeed. For Josh Greenberg, Groove Shark arbitrarily became his life's work. I doubt that's what he intended. But if his legacy is wrapped up in the company at all, it's not in the bottom line or the company's role in the music industry. It's in the people whose lives it changed. You know, I grew up with Groove Shark. I started out barely an adult. And I grew into this really responsible person. I'm not trying to tell, like, you know, brag or anything. It's just, I grew up. Everything I always thought that I could potentially possess that nobody ever realized was realized by about 80 of my best friends at a huge startup company. We grew up together. It was a surrogate for college. And yeah, we, we, but we were the we were the teachers and the professors, and yeah, you know, the curriculum might not have been as good as it could have been, but it was still pretty awesome. A lot of the staff have scattered now. Some have started their own companies; others are managers elsewhere. They've got real adult jobs all over the country, but they stay in touch with each other constantly, texting, emailing. They go to each other's weddings. The Groove Shark family, it seems, is likely to endure long after people forget the company that brought them together. Eric Mennel is a producer here at Gimlet. Coming up, we'll have scenes from the next episode of Startup after these words from our sponsors. Thanks to our sponsor, Squarespace. Squarespace is the easiest way to build a beautiful website, portfolio, or online store. Remember to use the offer code STARTUP to get 10% off your first purchase. Squarespace. Build it beautiful. In next week's episode of Startup, we'll meet someone in the fashion business, a woman whose inspiration for her company began in an unexpected place. I was screaming, hanging onto the edge of the doorway, begging her not to make me wear that to school. And I remember sitting in that classroom, knowing that people could see me, not worrying that they saw me crying, 
but worrying that they saw me in this stupid dress. A fashion crisis that sparked a business. That's coming up next week. And this week, be sure to check out the new episode from our friends at Reply All. Producer Shruti Penamanini tells a fascinating, weird story about a prisoner, his blog, and a controlling mother. Today's episode of Startup was produced by Bruce Wallace. It was edited by Alex Bloomberg, Peter Clowney, Caitlin Roberts, Molly Messick, Luke Malone, and me. Editing help from Lisa Pollock. Production assistance from Simone Polanin and Brian Orr. Mark Phillips wrote and performed our theme song. Build Buildings wrote and performed our special ad music. Additional music from RAC, Jeffrey Brodsky, White Dove, Devin Dare, and the band HotMoms.gov. Matthew Bowl mixed the episode. To subscribe to the podcast, go to iTunes or check out the Gimlet Media website at gimletmedia.com. You can follow us on Twitter at Podcast Startup. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next week. Thank you.